once they've reached the heavens, the astronauts themselves are fueled by sterilized, vacuum-sealed, vitamin-enriched, reconstituted space food. The cuisine aboard the shuttle has evolved from over three decades of research and careful planning. When America's space program began, scientists weren't positive that human beings could actually eat in space. They questioned an astronaut's ability to swallow in zero gravity. Perhaps food would become suspended in the windpipe and cause suffocation. In 1962, John Glenn became the first American to address the problem. Aboard his Mercury spacecraft, he took the first tentative bites of freeze-dried snacks, served up in squeezable tubes. The experiment was a success, even if it was only nominally appetizing. The Gemini flights in the mid-1960s engaged pairs of astronauts on longer and more complex missions, requiring larger food packs versus squeeze-tube snacks. The major Gemini innovation was reconstituting dehydrated meals. Apollo missions to the moon introduced the availability of hot water for warm meals, with meats and sauces prepared in aluminum foil containers. Skylab became the pinnacle of space gastronomics. Because of mission length, more attention was given to variety. The special dining area services three astronauts at once, with a hot plate to keep food warm and storage for frozen foods like ice cream and steak. During the Skylab Soyuz mission of 1975, Russia and America had an exchange of cuisine as well as science. Cosmonauts served tubes of borscht to the American astronauts. We carry all the food we need into orbit with us. A lot of our food is just like the food you'd eat at home. Bread, tuna fish, peanuts, cookies. Now first, the orange drink. We go over to the water dispenser, put it in, close it up, and really all that did is put a needle into the container. We choose the cold water. and that rehydrates the drink. Need to shake it around just a little bit. That's the orange drink. For the uh, frankfurters, really all we need to do to that is just put them in the oven. This is our oven up here. Just slip them right in, let them heat up. On the space shuttle, mealtime can have a surreal tone. Astronauts often eat hanging from the ceiling or sitting on the floor and plates aren't always needed as long as floating food is caught before it drifts away. Rounding up a renegade M&M candy soon becomes second nature for shuttle passengers, but very small pieces of unsupervised zero-gravity food could pose a major problem and put an entire mission at risk. That's why astronauts use liquid salt, which is mixed into their food while it's still in a sealed pack. Otherwise, individual grains would float around the cabin, harming the machinery, the electrical circuits, or be accidentally inhaled. An astronaut's main eating utensil is a pair of scissors, but once a package is snipped, a spoon can be used. Food is designed to be sticky so it adheres to earth utensils, this also allows it to be flung with great accuracy through the spacecraft or sucked from spinning silverware. Sometimes even liquids can be consumed without utensils or containers. Just as eating takes on new dimensions in space, so does sleep. Initially, scientists wondered how weightlessness would affect an astronaut's ability to sleep. Perhaps this strange environment would inspire bizarre nightmares, cause sleep disorders, and put the entire space program in jeopardy. The reverse is true. Crew members experience a unique zero-gravity relaxation. In the weightlessness of space, sleeping bodies tend to adopt a fetal position. Arms float out at shoulder level. 
knees bend. On the space shuttle, sunrise happens every 90 minutes. Astronauts often sleep wearing eye masks. When it came time to go to bed, I'd gather up the liner, my sleep mask, and my music recorder, and carry them up with me to the flight deck. When I got to the flight deck, I'd crawl into the blue bag, float just above the seat, between the seat and the ceiling, and right next to the windows. And when it was time to go to bed, I'd put on the sleep mask, put on the headphones to hear some music, try to get comfortable and go to sleep. Mission 51L, the 25th flight of the space shuttle program, began at 11.38 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 20th, 1986. It ended 73 seconds later in a structural break between the main fuel tanks and the Challenger orbiter. Relatively few people saw the accident in which seven crew members perished when it was broadcast live on national television. By 1986, the public had been lulled into benign disinterest due to the cool efficiency of NASA and the routine of shuttle missions that disguised the disturbing reality that spaceflight is dangerous. Impatience had grown at the launch site. The Challenger had been fueled and was waiting for favorable weather conditions. A long delayed blast off was finally set for a chilly Tuesday morning, even though overnight ice had accumulated on the launch pad. The previous evening, several operational water systems had been opened up and allowed to flow into drains, but those drains froze up and caused overflows. Air temperature at launch was 36 degrees, 15 degrees colder than any previous attempt. T minus seven minutes, 30 seconds. The ground launch sequencer begins retracting the crew access arm. And the last emergency evacuation exit for the seven astronauts pulls away. T minus three minutes, 15 seconds. The rotating gimbals of the orbiter's three main engines are checked, then returned to start positions. T minus two minutes, 50 seconds. Retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood. T minus 16 seconds. Sound suppression water sprayed to absorb engine vibrations. Hydrogen igniters fire to burn off residual chemical vapors. T minus 6.6 .6 seconds. Main engines ignited in sequence. Thrust from the rockets bend the shuttle stack. When it returns to full vertical position, solid rocket boosters are ignited. NASA cameras record smoke emerging near the connecting ring of the right solid rocket booster. No one is aware that the cold temperature has compromised the seal between two booster segments and that a searing hot flare is eating through the thin metal casing which holds millions of pounds of the most powerful rocket fuel ever blended. and it has cleared the tower. 7.74 seconds. The roll maneuver is initiated. Special long-range cameras capture the side flare growing ominously. Velocity 2257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Inside the main fuel tank, the liquid propellants spark an uncontrollable chemical reaction. Challenger, go at throttle up. Velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. The solid rocket boosters revolve in a chaotic spiral until a range safety officer initiates their remote control destruction 110 seconds after launch. The Challenger orbiter itself is not destroyed by the explosion, but rather by the erratic aerodynamic effects on the ship as it careens out of control. The crew cabin remains intact and briefly emerges from the fireball before its plummet to the sea. A 
large-scale search was initiated to recover the debris. 22 ships, six underwater vessels, 33 aircraft, 